Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everyone. Uh, with you is uh, Dr. Abdul Majid Zubaydi. Uh, I'm an intervention cardiologist in Abu Dhabi and the president of the Emirate Cardiac Society. And today uh, I'm in. Uh, uh, I'm uh, honored to, uh, you know, to introduce and uh, moderate this uh, uh, session, uh, which is part of a series of uh, uh, educational activities uh, called Acute Coronary Syndrome uh, Case-Based uh, Series. Uh, last year, we had multiple um, sessions of this uh, kind and we focused on uh, different aspects in the management of acute coronary syndrome. Uh, tonight, uh, we will have a, uh, a session focused on antiplatelet uh, treatment. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to have uh, colleagues of mine uh, to participate in this uh, uh, session. Uh, we have Dr. Tariq uh, Helmi from uh, Louisiana, United States, and we have Dr. Fabrizio Clemente from uh, Sheikh Khalifa Hospital in uh, Ras al Khaimah. Uh, before I start, just uh, I want to make sure that uh, uh, you, uh, you, you know, this session is, is an interactive session, and uh, participating in it is uh, very important. Uh, we have, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please place them in the question answer uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the application. And uh, also, uh, this activity is a CME activity, so uh, please fill the form uh, at the end and uh, make sure that, you know, that the, those are completed so you can get uh, uh, your, uh, your uh, CME points from the organizing uh, Company. Uh, I'm not going to uh, spend uh, more time on this. I will go direct to uh, Dr. Tariq. Uh, so Dr. Tariq Helmi is a uh, professor of medicine and chief of cardiology and co-director of Heart and Vascular uh, Institute at Oshner Health Science Center in Shreveport, uh, Louisiana. But Dr. Tariq is going to talk to us about uh, a review on uh, antiplatelet therapy in patients who present with uh, acute coronary syndrome. So, Dr. Tariq, uh, please go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be with you and uh, to meet with everyone here, uh, all uh, friends and colleagues. Um, my task today is to, to talk about uh, the antiplatelet therapy in patients with uh, acute coronary syndrome. And again, it's, it's a great honor to be part of this series by the uh, uh, Emirati Cardiac Society. Um, so uh, we're gonna start off with the, uh, some of the uh, basic uh, concepts and uh, we'll talk about the, the mechanism of action of uh, certain drugs that we use for uh, platelet inhibition. Then we'll talk about some of the uh, trial data that actually got these medications uh, to market and into the guidelines. And then we'll talk about a little bit of the guidelines and uh, the recent updates, duration of therapy after acute coronary syndrome and after stenting, do we load or do we not preload uh, patients with acute coronary syndrome, non-STEMI, and uh, the most recent guidelines from the ACC um, about uh, triple therapy uh, and the use of anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy concomitantly. So I'll start off with a, with a busy slide and I apologize for this, but uh, it just uh, highlights the complicated pathways that are involved in, in platelet function. Uh, and as you can see to the side here, the, the basic functions of platelets are adhesion. Whenever the collagen is exposed with endothelial injury, the von Willebrand factor is activated and attaches uh, the, the platelets to the collagen, then activation uh, follows. Uh, and after the platelets are activated, uh, then they aggregate and they form the uh, white thrombus, uh, which then uh, acts as an itis for the red thrombus. And this is sort of a, a, a broken down basic concept of uh, what uh, medications uh, affect which uh, receptors. So we understand that the aspirin is a cyclooxygenase uh, uh, pathway uh, inhibitor and uh, prevents the thromboxane uh, formation and activation of platelets through that pathway. Uh, we have the thionopyridines, which affect the P2Y12, and uh, we have the clopidogrel, prasigular, and ticlopidine, and as you all know, tic tacagulor is a different uh, category of, uh, of medicine. 
which also does affect the P2Y12 uh, receptors. Uh, all these uh, 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 medications and all these receptors affect the platelet activation. And once platelets are activated, they, they change into a, a, a different form where you have these dendritic formations uh, 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 happening with the, with the platelets and then they connect to each other via the 2B3A uh, receptors and uh, that ensues the formation of the, uh, the, the white clot and the platelet clot and the nidus for uh, the thrombus. Um, we have uh, other factors that actually do inhibit platelets, the direct thrombins. Thrombin is one of the most potent uh, platelet activators. Uh, and when you have thrombin inhibitors, this does uh, uh, have an effect on platelet uh, activation as well. And then uh, we have the phosphodiesterase inhibitors as well, which do have a role in platelet activation. But we're gonna focus mostly on uh, the aspirin as a background therapy, and we're gonna focus on this group of, of uh, medications uh, that we're gonna talk about today and their use in patients with acute coronary syndrome. So these are the different uh, uh, drugs, the, the taclopidine, the clopidogrel, plavix, as we know it, prasugrel is effient, and ticagrel is berlenta. Uh, they all affect the P2Y12 uh, receptors. Important to remember that uh, uh, clopidogrel is a prodrug and it needs two steps of activation to get to active drug. Prasugrel is a prodrug as well, but it only needs one step of activation. Ticagrelor is an active drug. You take the pill, and you don't need any metabolism and it goes to the receptor and it blocks the receptor. Interestingly enough, ticagrelor is a reversible uh, blocker of the P2Y12 receptors. The prasugrel and the clopidogrel, they attach the receptor, they don't leave, um, which means that uh, 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 the receptor is attached to the drug. And a lot of people argue that the action, actually uh, they're potentially reversible if you give more platelets because the drug does not leave the receptor. Um, with ticagrelor, uh, it's a dynamic process where you have a steady state of the drug that attaches and releases uh, the receptor in the platelets, which makes it uh, much more uh, difficult to control uh, the pharmacodynamics uh, and the platelet activation. So uh, copergolor thanopyridine, presgolor thanopyridine, and ticagrelor is uh, trialoxanopyrimidine. This is the only reversible uh, agent. Uh, the slide uh, focuses on the onset of action. And as you all know, clopidogrel with the 600 milligram load, uh, you can get actually uh, a significant plate of uh, inhibition within uh, two hours. Uh, Prasugrel and ticagrelor, you get effect within 30 minutes. That's why uh, the, the onset of action is, is quite rapid and they have been uh, quite uh, popular in the use uh, for patients uh, with acute coronary syndrome. Uh, duration of effects, again, three to four days, it's reversible, about five to seven days, which is basically the lifespan of the platelet uh, between five and 10 days. Um, and the recommended uh, withdrawal before surgery is about five days for all drugs, uh, regardless of their pharmacodynamics. So let's uh, switch gears and now talk about a little bit of the trial data that got us to where we are with uh, uh, clopidogrel and with uh, prasugrel and then with ticagrelor. Uh, the CURE trial looked at the addition of uh, clopidogrel uh, to aspirin uh, in patients with acute coronary syndrome. And you can see here, we're all familiar with this, uh, just a refresher that there is significant reduction in, in the cumulative uh, endpoint of events in favor of the combination of, of uh, Plavix versus uh, aspirin alone. And the, the combined endpoint was death from cardiovascular causes, myocardial infarction or stroke. And this was uh, 12 months. And this basically was the, um, uh, the stimulus for us to actually recommend initially that uh, patients who present with acute coronary syndrome uh, as patients in the CURE trial uh, be given uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, including Plavix for at least uh, nine to 12 months because this was the duration of the trial and this was the endpoint that showed significant benefits of the combination dual antiplatelet therapy as compared to uh, aspirin alone. Um, Plavix or clopidogrel was also used in STEMI patients. And uh, this is uh, one of the trials that actually led to the uh, guidelines for STEMI. Uh, the COMMIT trial was a large uh, number of patients trial that was conducted mostly in China, it was around 40,000 patients. And uh, the interesting thing about this trial is that not everybody got uh, angioplasty. A lot of these patients got medical therapy, a lot of them got lytics. And as you can see, the addition of Plavix uh, or clopidogrel to the uh, and, uh, Carbonylic therapy and antiplatelet therapy regimen 
uh, at baseline uh, resulted in significant benefits, uh, both in death and the combined endpoint with uh, a p-value that is statistic, uh, statistically significant in both these endpoints uh, and significant reduction of reinfarction as well. So uh, uh, clopidogrel is beneficial uh, to be added in patients with acute coronary syndrome, but also in patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction, whether they do or do not uh, go to the cath lab and get a stent. Uh, again, a large number of these patients did not end up uh, with primary PCI or an angioplasty uh, in this trial. Let's talk about Prasugrel. And the Tritin TIMI 38 trial uh, was, a patient, uh, was a study that randomized patients with acute coronary syndrome who actually went to PCI and got a stent. So this is an important uh, distinction with Prasugrel because the trial was for patients with acute coronary syndrome who actually got stents. And, and then they were randomized uh, to Prasugrel uh, versus clopidogrel uh, to, uh, in addition to the aspirin. And as you can see here, uh, the efficacy endpoint uh, was significantly uh, uh, in favor of Prasugrel uh, as compared to, uh, to Plavis Clopidogrel. And this was the death, cardiovascular causes, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke. And this was driven basically by non-fatal MI and reduction of stent thrombosis. But unfortunately, there was a price to pay. And as you can see here, that the safety endpoint with major bleeding uh, was higher in the Prasugrel arm. So that led to the uh, uh, black box warning and, and patients who are at high risk for bleeding and for strokes and uh, elderly patients and low body weight. And you all are familiar with this and we're not gonna go over this. I think Dr. Fabrizio will, will have a case to talk about uh, patients with high risk of bleeding. So we'll, we'll let that discussion uh, happen later. What about Ticagalor or Berlinta? Uh, the PLATO trial uh, was the, the one that was the pivotal trial for uh, Ticagalor. And as you can see here, again, Tarcagalor was randomized against Plavix uh, in addition to aspirin in patients presenting with acute coronary syndrome. Interestingly enough, uh, the, uh, the Tarcagalor was given prior to going to the cath lab. And uh, if patients were actually deemed to be uh, managed with medical therapy, they continued on the Tarcagalor. So this was an all-comer acute coronary syndrome uh, patient uh, trial uh, as compared to Prasugula was basically for patients who got stents. And as you can see here, there was a significant benefit uh, for the Ticagalor as compared to clopidogrel in addition to aspirin in these uh, subgroup of patients. And this included actually a, a significant mortality benefit uh, with reduction of mortality uh, with the Ticagalor group. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, it seemed that people uh, felt that this was a sweet spot where no, risk, uh, no increase in bleeding was noted in the trial, but with significant improvement in the efficacy and reduction in ischemic events. So Ticagalor after this, this trial was basically uh, the drug that achieved a reduction in ischemic events without uh, any added uh, cost of bleeding in these patients with acute coronary syndrome. And that led to the Ticagalor getting into the uh, guidelines and we'll talk about how it evolved from this point in time. But if you look at the, the different trials, this is the Cure, this is the Triton for, Prasug for Prasugril, and this is the Plato for Ticagalor. Uh, if you look at the mortality benefit, uh, a cure did not show mortality benefit, Triton didn't show mortality benefit, but if you look at the Plato, and you can see here that uh, the, the confidence interval is significant uh, on the, the left side of the unity line, so it's significantly uh, in favor of Ticagalor, and bleeding was not increased in the, in the Plato trial uh, uh, as compared to both the cure and the Triton 38. So again, if you look at the data as it stands, uh, Ticagalor looks like a pretty good medicine with significant reduction in ischemic events without a significant uh, price to pay in terms of bleeding. So let's look at the guidelines and let's see how, how we evolved into this set of guidelines that uh, basically uh, help us manage our patients who present with acute coronary syndrome. So if you look at uh, patients who present with acute coronary syndrome, non-ST elevation uh, or STEMI, if patients go to medical therapy, uh, the uh, clopidogrel or uh, ticagalor uh, should be given, uh, initiated. Uh, again, remember, uh, patients uh, who got the prasugrel in the study in the Triton uh, had PCI. So when you look at the PCI patients, which are the majority of the patients that we actually take care of, patients presenting with acute coronary syndrome, they go to the cath lab, they get PCI, and they can have Plavix, prasugrel, or ticagalor. Um, if patients go to lytic therapy, which not a lot of people use now, uh, the data for uh, clopidogrel is uh, robust with the commit and the clarity trials, but uh, there's really uh, not a lot of, of data for 
lytic therapy with prasoberyl or ticagrelor. That's why the guidelines actually state that Plavix is recommended uh, for lytic therapy. Of course, now the guidelines for STEMI, uh, if you get lytic therapy, there's the pharmacoinvasive strategy, which everybody, almost everybody goes to the cath lab and they get a, a review of the angiogram. And if you get a stent, then you jump into this category. We can actually use any of these antiplatelet therapies. Now, remember, uh, patients with ACS, and we'll talk about this, a recommendation is for 12 months, 12 months, 12 months, 12 months, one year, even after cabbage. So keep in mind that there are indications for antiplatelet therapy uh, in, in these patients uh, for acute coronary syndrome that is totally different from uh, requirements for antiplatelet therapy uh, in patients who get stents. And although this is an ACS uh, talk, I'll just uh, sort of uh, go to a sideline here and talk about uh, patients with stable ischemic heart disease who uh, get a, a drug eluting stent. And now the recommendations, as you all know, is now up to six months or down to six months. Um, and if you have a significant risk of bleeding, you can go down to three months. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is both for uh, DES in stable patients and uh, patients with acute coronary syndrome. So uh, just a quick note here again about the use of ticagrelor in patients who get uh, 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 stents or medical therapy. Uh, again, Plato included patients uh, with ACS who was, uh, were treated medically, but for Prasugrel, uh, again, the Titan included patients with stenting and it's only indicated after coronary artery stent implantation, the use of Prasugrel in ACS patients. So keep that in mind uh, as you use these medications uh, and uh, treat your patients. So let's look at the guidelines again uh, with patients for, for PCI, uh, stable ischemic heart disease, who get a drug eluting stent. We talked about uh, initially we were, were putting everybody on uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months. Now it's six months. And if you have a high bleeding risk, you can actually stop it at three months. And uh, there's some data behind that and we'll go over the data for that. But again, for acute coronary syndrome, 12 months of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy is recommended unless you have a significant risk of bleeding. And we'll talk about some of the data that is emerging that has not made it into the guidelines yet that may actually challenge this uh, paradigm of having patients on dual antiplatelet therapy for at least 12 months after acute coronary syndrome. And again, remember, this is uh, regardless of stenting or no stenting acute coronary syndrome based on the CURE trial, uh, it buys you 12 months of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy regardless. All right, so uh, let's talk about um, drug eluting stents and stable coronary disease, uh, how it uh, came down from 12 months to six months to three months now, and there, there are multiple, we published on this uh, back in 2015, there are multiple trials, as you can see here, there's a long list of trials looking at three or six months versus 12 months, and as you can see, uh, there is no detrimental effect for shortening dual antiplatelet therapy in patients with stable ischemic heart disease who get drug eluting stents. Now, there are some trials that showed significant benefit, including the famous DAPT trial, which was a 10,000 patient trial uh, that showed significant uh, reduction in ischemic events uh, for even prolonged DAPT beyond 12 months. It was uh, 24 months. Uh, but as you remember, there was increased risk of bleeding and uh, you know, one of the findings of the study that was uh, increased overall mortality, not related to cardiac mortality with the uh, DAPT trial. And if you look at uh, the bleeding risk, uh, the bleeding risk is significantly improved uh, if you shorten your uh, DAPT uh, duration. So you get improvement uh, in, in bleeding uh, and you don't pay a price uh, in terms of ischemic um, uh, burden or ischemic events or stent thrombosis in this case. And uh, the guidelines looked at all these trials and they said, okay, well, maybe we should consider six months. And if it, the patient is really at high risk for bleeding or has to go to surgery, then we can stop it at three months. Uh, so that's for uh, stable ischemic heart disease. So uh, what about ACS? And we talked about the CURE trial uh, recommending, uh, or based on the CURE trial, the recommendations uh, are that we keep patients uh, on dual antiplatelet therapy for at least 12 months uh, after acute coronary syndrome. The TWILIGHT uh, trial uh, recently came out in 2019, and this is a reference New England Journal of Medicine. Roxana Mehran was the lead author on this. Um, and this actually, uh, it was a double blind, uh, blind uh, trial, randomized trial. Uh, it looked at patients with a uh, high risk of, of ischemic events, including patients with troponin positive acute coronary syndrome. And uh, they got three months of dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, and then they were randomized to continue uh, ticagrelor uh, with aspirin or ticagrelor alone for the rest of the year. So patients presenting with acute coronary syndrome 
got dual antiplatelet therapy for three months. And after the three months, they were stay, stayed on ticagalor. And along with ticagalor, the randomization was, do we add the Plavix, or uh, do we add the aspirin, or do we take the aspirin away and continue on single antiplatelet therapy, which is ticagalor for the rest of the 12 months. And as you can see here, if you look at the ischemic uh, events, death, uh, uh, MI, or non-fatal stroke, there was no difference between uh, the ticagalor plus aspirin or uh, the ticagalor alone after the three months. So this is very interesting that actually withholding uh, the aspirin and continuing on ticagalor in patients with acute coronary syndrome uh, did not actually have any detrimental effects in terms of the combined endpoint of ischemic events. But if you continued uh, the uh, ticagalor uh, with the aspirin, there was significant increase in bleeding. Uh, so again, this goes along the paradigm of, can we actually shorten the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy while using ticagalor, which is a more potent uh, antiplatelet uh, agent uh, affecting the P2Y12 and take away the aspirin and uh, reduce the uh, risk of bleeding while uh, maintaining the safety and the efficacy of uh, decreased ischemic events. This trial has not made it into the, uh, the guidelines yet, and we'll see when the new guidelines come out whether this is going to be a point that they will revise. So it's a fine balance, as, as you all know, uh, between the ischemic risk and the bleeding risk. And uh, this is a, basically a table looking at what causes patients to be at high risk for bleeding, um, oral anticoagulation, of course, uh, advanced age, low body weight, chronic disease, chronic kidney disease, and diabetes. All are uh, risk factors for uh, bleeding. And if you look at the ischemic risk, there are patient factors with advanced age, ACS presentation, extensive coronary disease, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. These apparently um, are now recurring themes where patients uh, are at high risk for uh, 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 ischemic events. Uh, when you look at stent thrombosis, which is one of the major drivers for the dual antiplatelet therapy after stenting, uh, ACS presentation, diabetes again, uh, first uh, generation drug eluting stents uh, were uh, more likely to have stent thrombosis, but there are technical issues. There are stent undersizing or under deployment. There is small stent diameter. There's long uh, stented segment and bifurcation uh, stents and instant restenosis all are factors uh, that promote the risk of stent thrombosis in these patients. And as you're all aware, there's a DAPT score now that you can actually calculate uh, and it's available on a, on a calculator. You don't have to memorize all this. And uh, it takes into account the risk of bleeding, but also the risk of stent thrombosis or an ischemic event. And if your score is greater than two, uh, then the benefit uh, is for a prolonged uh, dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for at least 12 months. So th this is uh, sort of an overall view of uh, management of ACS uh, patients with dual antiplatelet therapy. A couple of more points that we need to touch on. Do we pre-treat these patients or do not pre-treat these patients? So somebody comes into the emergency department with acute coronary syndrome with a small bump in troponin, they're stable. Uh, do you actually start them on uh, aspirin and Plavix or do you start them on aspirin and hold the uh, P2Y12 uh, uh, for later? And if you look at the ACHA guidelines, uh, you know, the preloading was, has always been a part of the guidelines. Patients present with ACS, you give them aspirin, you give them uh, uh, a P2Y12, and uh, then you uh, eventually decide on invasive versus non-invasive or conservative strategy. Most of them end up in the cath lab and they get a stent. And if you can see here the algorithm, uh, early invasive strategy, you load the patients uh, way up in the, in the decision tree, and as you go down, they go to the cath lab and they get a stent later. Uh, and here you have medical therapy as one of the options, but you've already given the P2Y12 inhibitor uh, upstream. The most re uh, recent uh, revision of the European guidelines uh, uh, in 2020, uh, it is not recommended to administer routine pretreatment for a P2Y12 in patients with acute coronary syndrome. And if you look down here, Again, it's in the highlights what is new. It is not recommended to administer routine P2Y12 to patients with acute coronary uh, syndrome without uh, knowing the anatomy of uh, the coronaries. Uh, that means after you take them to the cath lab. In fact, the, the recommendation for P2Y12 now is a class three recommendation until you figure out what the coronary anatomy is and whether the patient is or is not a candidate for PCI or do they need emergent cabbage. Um, these are you know, considerations that were uh, factored in in making these recommendations. But interestingly, the pretreatment, the routine 
pre-administration with P2Y12 is now a class three in the European guidelines. Uh, and we'll see with the updated guidelines from the ACCHA whether this is gonna gain any traction or be a con consideration or not. Uh, this was based on a couple of trials. Uh, the ACOS trial was one of the uh, uh, trials that showed uh, actually no benefit uh, in, in patients who got pretreated uh, with Prasugril uh, upstream before going to the cath lab. And the ISR REACT, although it, it was a, uh, a Prasugril versus a Ticagrelor tri tri uh, trial, um, the Ticagrelor is actually uh, given uh, pretreatment, uh, pre going to the cath lab, as compared to Prasugril, it was given uh, during or after the coronary angiography. And as you can see here, the, uh, the Prasugril strategy uh, given at the angiography was superior to the Ticagrelor. So again, this is more evidence that pretreatment may not be as beneficial as we uh, initially thought and may be uh, something to reconsider with the new guidelines coming up. Uh, the last point to make, um, and I know we're getting short on time, so I'm going to make this uh, fairly brief. The most recent uh, uh, guidelines came out for uh, uh, triple therapy, anticoagulation, uh, along in patients who need antiplatelet therapy. Uh, and uh, there's been a little bit of a change. Uh, now, the triple therapy is recommended for the shortest possible time. And then you'll see uh, as we go through the uh, the decision charts that uh, you can actually get away without giving triple therapy at all. Uh, when combination of antithrombotic therapy is needed, uh, clopidogrel is uh, preferred over the P2Y12s and uh, NOACs or DOACs are preferred over warfarin. Patients with high thrombotic risk, triple therapy uh, can be used for 30 days and beyond 30 days is not recommended. Um, and standard duration antibiotic therapy along with anticoagulation will go over this and uh, we'll talk about it in the decision tree. All right, so it's a busy slide, but we'll go through this uh, and we'll focus on the highlights. So don't, don't look at the big picture and just, uh, just let's just focus here. Uh, so patient with atrial fibrillation uh, on uh, oral anticoagulation uh, now needs uh, as a PCI, needs a PCI. So he's already on anticoagulation and now needs a PCI. So um, he goes, he either gets warfarin or DOAC, which he's taking before. Now he goes to PCI and he gets the procedure. So you hold the, the DOACs until you get to the procedure. And then you go, if he's been on a DOAC, you restart the, the DOAC again and initiate uh, P2Y12, okay? Uh, as you can see here, uh, there's no aspirin. Uh, it is only uh, DOACs and P2Y12. Uh, if he has been uh, um, on warfarin and you restart the anticoagulation, DOAC is preferred and initiate P2Y12. There is no aspirin here. Now, in patients with high risk for ischemia, uh, you can add aspirin 81 milligrams for a short period of time, which is 30 days, okay? So, uh, and then PCI for ACS, continue P2Y12 for 12 months and uh, stop the antiplatelet therapy and continue DOAC alone. And uh, let me just move this here. Uh, moved it too much. There we go. And patients with uh, stable ischemic heart disease uh, who got a DES uh, on discharge, you know, continue uh, oral anticoagulation uh, therapy with DOAX and then P2I12 for six months. And then either continue the P2I12 or switch them to aspirin for 12 months. And then after 12 months, you stop the antiplatelet therapy and continue uh, anticoagulation alone. So historically, we've always had aspirin as background therapy uh, for patients with coronary artery disease. Now we can see that uh, you know, antiplatelet therapy is no longer a recommendation and you can continue with anticoagulation by itself. Uh, even after uh, ACS or immediate stenting, you can actually get away with uh, DOAX and P2I12, DOAX and P2I12 without aspirin. If you need to put aspirin on board, put it on for 30 days in patients with uh, high risk of uh, ischemic events. Now, what happens if somebody is on antiplatelet therapy and now develops atrial fibrillation? Uh, and now you, you wanna put them on anticoagulation. And the question is, are they anticoagulation candidates? And the answer is yes. Then you look at the main reason for antiplatelet therapy, primary prevention, you stop the antiplatelet therapy and you continue with the anticoagulation. Stable ischemic heart disease with no ACS and you look at PCI, and if you have a stent that's more than 12 months, you stop the antiplatelet therapy and you continue with anticoagulants alone. 
if the DES is six to 12 months, you can consider continuing the, uh, the aspirin of P2Y12 uh, for the 12 months uh, and then stop the antiplatelet and continue the anticoagulation alone. Uh, ACS, if the time for ACS is less than 12 months, then the recommendation is continue P2Y12. And then after 12 months, you stop the P2Y12 and continue anticoagulation alone. If the ACS is more than 12 months, you stop the antiplatelet therapy and continue anticoagulation alone. So any which way you look at it. Now, triple therapy is, is not a strong recommendation. It is allowed for about 30 days in patients with increased risk for ischemic events. Um, even after a stent, the recommendation is to go with a P2Y12 uh, and uh, oral anticoagulants, uh, preferably NOAX or DOAX. Um, and then when the indication for antiplatelet therapy is complete, uh, you stop the antiplatelet therapy and you continue patients on oral anticoagulants uh, alone. Um, uh, there are guidelines also for uh, thromboembolism and PE, which we're not going to go over, but uh, again, it echoes the same thing. Triple therapy is, is not uh, recommended. And if it is given, it is going to be given for the shortest time uh, possible. So in summary, uh, we've reviewed the mechanism of action of antiplatelet therapy. We looked at the trial data with uh, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and uh, ticagrelor. We looked at the duration of therapy, whether for stable ischemic heart disease or for ACS, and uh, whether there are going to be uh, a revision of some of the guidelines based on the uh, twilight study. Uh, preload or no preload, this is a discrepancy between the European guidelines and the American guidelines. Uh, and of course, the triple therapy and anticoagulation in the setting of antiplatelet therapy. We just went over that with the most recent uh, revision of the guidelines uh, for the ACC AHA. Um, I thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. And we'll stop right here and we'll uh, switch to the case studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Talif. I think this is uh, great uh, while you're switching uh, uh, to your case. Uh, you know, I think despite all the data and the information that we had over the last uh, years, you know, uh, the decision making, as you showed in the decision trees and the algorithms of uh, managing patients is still is not so straightforward. Uh, and it depends on a lot of factors. I mean, uh, it just tells us that, you know, still we need to look at the patients assess our patients carefully in terms of risk, in terms of bleeding, before we make any um, decisions as to, you know, which uh, drug do you select, which combination do you select, and for how long uh, do you give it. So um, to the, to the um, audience, and we got uh, more than 350 people online, and, and this is great. We need uh, uh, your participation, so please uh, feel free to put your question and answers and we'll do our best to answer them. Uh, Dr. Tarek, I'm not going to delay you from your case. Uh, that's why we selected, I mean, we selected cases to give you a flavor and that the decision is not so straightforward. And when you face such cases, you know, the best thing is if you're not sure, discuss and um, go to the details of the case uh, before, you know, before you give a recommendation. All right, Amadid, do you see my, uh, my slide set for the case presentation? Uh, no, I see still, I see case presentation. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, that's it. That's case presentation. Excellent. Yes. Okay, so we'll go over a, a case and uh, I, I will give you a sort of a, a, a submission right off the bat. Uh, this is not a perfect case. So th this is going to be a, a real life thing and uh, there's going to be a lot of controversy. There's going to be a lot of decisions to be made. And, uh, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. So that's we'll start we off because with the... I want to show the flavor that it's not as simple as you know, as people sometimes would think. Yes, agreed, agreed. Sure. And, you know, uh, everyday decisions are, are, are difficult and every patient is different. So uh, I think uh, uh, you and Dr. Fabrizio also have uh, interesting cases to present. So we'll start with this one. Uh, this is a, a 65 year old female who presents with chest pain. Um, she has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, but no diabetes. Uh, the chest pain was vague, uh, but had some concerning features. Uh, and uh, this is the EKG. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, there's mm. some concerning uh, uh, ST segment shifts, but uh, compared to the old EKG, she had this little, th this, this pattern of a slight J point elevation. And looking at this, uh, the, the team was not initially very concerned that uh, this qualifies uh, as a STEMI. Uh, so what do you all think of the EKG? Um, 
any thoughts, Abdul Majid or Dr. Fabrizio? I think in this setting of uh, chest pain, um, you know, I would be uh, concerned, you know, I mean, the pattern uh, looks like an ST elevation pattern. I know it doesn't meet the thrombolytic criteria, but, you know, obviously there is a pattern in lead two, three AVF and then in the lateral leads. Um, so uh, I would be, I would take it serious, you know, if the patient is getting chest pain, at least, you know, you know, if you're not taking this patient or you're not, you know, take it into the cath lab, I would do an echo just to look at the regional wall motion abnormality. Excellent. But in our center, in our center, I would take into the cath lab. Excellent. Uh, would yeah, you I initiate agree. therapy? I agree I don't with Dr. Yeah. All right. I mean, I, I agree with Dr. Abdul Majid. There is some, yeah, there is some J point shift, uh, not, not really uh, enough for go on with uh, any primary or thrombolytic but uh, he has chest pain as no i don't know if it was ongoing or not chest pain so needs attention if you need to treat directly with aspirin at least uh, sure i would treat with aspirin at least because there is signs of you know, uh, ischemic changes here and there I agree. So, so you want to treat with aspirin alone. You want to give aspirin and a, and, a, and, a, and a P2I12. And if you are, which of the P2I12 would you choose? Flavix, Ticagrelor, or Prasugrel? So if you ask Mike, if I can answer, uh, so let's, let's go back to no preloading or not preloading before Correct. we know the anatomy. <laughs> Here we are. So I'm, I'm from Italy, so I should follow the ACS guidelines. <laughs> and you are okay. from US, so you should follow the ACC guidelines. <laughs> Anyhow, okay. usually so, I preload. I preload with both of the uh, medication. I, I'm not following the recommendation of ACS regarding knowing the anatomy or not. I feel like I... Even we don't have yeah, actually still, any any trial, no, giving exactly. Yeah, there is comparison with prasugrel versus tagagular, prasugrel uh, not preloaded and tagagular preloaded. But anyhow, we're two different molecules, so we cannot compare the data. It was not a trial comparing preloading versus not preloading strategy at all for me. Okay, right. Abdul Majid, would you preload? Pre yeah, I mean, still our protocol. I mean, despite that data that you showed. Uh, that we do, uh, our protocol is we preload such patients and uh, we, uh, you know, aspirin, anticoagulor is, uh, is the, you know, is, is our protocol. And, and yeah, so, so we usually preload with the uh, tagular. And I think, okay. you know, that's, that's a very important point to kind of highlight, you know. And, and keeping be... in mind that Prasugril is, is an agent that is available, but it's, it's mostly been studied in patients who actually uh, ended up with a stent. So uh, again, this patient is, is you know, has unknown anatomy. Yeah. Yeah. So and that's uh, again, discussion uh, the part is the process, you know, with that data that you showed from the ISA uh, uh, five or React five, they, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know what is the impact on practice in a different places of the world. Did people believe in the process? Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, uh, process is, is is cheaper medicine, and uh, and if that data is true. Uh, that would be, uh, that's interesting. I know it's an open label trial. There's a limitation to it. Correct. But the practical girl better than Ticagrelor, that's a, you know. It, it is an interesting question. So strong, huh? yeah. But again, uh, this is the, the, the ESC guidelines for uh, no preloading uh, based on that close trial. But uh, uh, all interesting points. So they decided to go ahead and uh, give aspirin and check troponins and follow the patient. 20 minutes later, she had more chest pain and this is her EKG. Mm -hmm. So as you can see here for, for the audience, uh, there's significant shift now in, in, in the ST segment and there's clear ST elevation of the reciprocal changes. So this is now a STEMI and there's no question about it. Uh, the, the, the panelists and, and the, my colleagues were concerned initially and their concerns have proven to be valid. And now the patient has a STEMI, so STEMI protocol loaded with ticagrelor along with the aspirin, emergent PCI. So let's go over the pictures. And you can see here that uh, as expected, there's a, an acute occlusion of uh, the RCA. And this was uh, crossed. And the first thing you notice here is that uh, the RCA overall uh, appears to be a smaller caliber vessel. Uh, and the distal runoff is, is uh, not as robust as you would expect from an RCA that would have significant SD elevations on the EKG and the inferior leads to three and EDF. Um, 
and the significant disease, diffuse disease. The occlusion started here, and you can see that there's diffuse calcified disease all the way uh, to the middle of the vessel. Yeah. So this is another picture, and uh, they ballooned it, they stented it, and this was the end result. Um, this is a 2-5 stent, this is a 2-2-5 stent. And as you can see here, uh, there is some uh, incomplete expansion of the stent down here. They were concerned this is an elderly lady, lady with a smaller vessel, calcified lesion. Uh, so they stopped here and they thought this was a, a good result overall. Again, even after uh, stenting of the vessel, you can see here that this is at best a codominant RCA uh, and the distal runoff in this vessel is not very robust. So taking a picture of the left system, we can see that there is disease in the LAD over here, significant disease in the LAD right there. And this is the PLOM. And there's also diffuse uh, segment of disease up to 70% here and here in this segment. So based on the guidelines, uh, and as you take care of this patient in the cath lab, uh, do you go for Culprit vessel only revascularization, discharge and evaluate, or uh, PCI uh, with multi vessel complete revascularization in the same setting or the same admission. And we can open this up for, I guess, the audience uh, to see what the audience want to do if we have a response system, or we can just talk about this amongst us, the panelists. Uh, Ziad uh, from uh, the control, can you put a poll there? If possible, otherwise we'll, uh... yeah, so there you go. So please select what you think and uh, well, what would you do? So Ziad, is it open? The poll in progress, doctor. Okay, excellent. Thank you. We cannot click, I think, because I cannot I click. Guess, so. Yeah, we can. I guess we cannot. I know this is going to be a divided. Uh, Which is a good thing. I told you this is not a perfect thing. case. There's no right answer. <laughs> and it's so, very uh, hard. Very hard to us. Not so. So for, uh, yeah. shall, okay. we, shall, yeah. shall we give yeah. our our opinion? Yeah. Sure. Sure. So. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Abdul Mashid. I will, I will, I will follow. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. They got the poll. So it's a Dr. Tarif. Go ahead, please. You have the poll result. Okay. Yes, I have. Excellent. So yeah. about seventy percent uh, PCI in the same setting. So uh, let's go over some of the data. Why, why this is uh, split, and and where where do we get the data for same setting? Yeah. Uh, okay. Fabrizio, what do you think? Sorry, Fabrizio. I don't know what. No, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Practice at your so if I can, if I can give my opinion, so usually uh, uh, we don't we don't proceed with the same same intervention uh, PCI multi vessel PCI in case of STEMI. Usually we delay for a few days. Uh, we know the the data, and we know that actually patient with multi vessel disease uh, after STEMI should go through complete vascularization in the same admission. There are no data or very limited data about same PCI procedure or different one. Uh, my personal feeling is I don't want to have another stent thrombosis in different territory after one STEMI. So I prefer to delay for a few days in order to, for, the, for, the, for the heart to recover a little bit and post risk of ischemia and another ischemia and other ischemia in other in other in other uh, remote area. Uh, okay. Usually, I mean, unless there is very easy PCI, very very simple shot lesion. Okay, so maybe sometimes we'll do it. Otherwise, usually we don't. So your your so your strategy is stay within be, the yeah within same the ad, same admission but not same setting. Okay, uh, Tara, uh, please go ahead. Sure. So we'll, we'll go over the data that, that uh, sort of came up with this. And uh, there are multiple trials. There's a PREMI, there's a culprit. Okay. Yep. So there's a PREMI, there's a culprit, and there's a pre-multi. Uh, and as you can see, a PREMI should, did immediate at the same time the PCI, same procedure. But the culprit and the pre-multi stage it within the index admission. And this is where you have a little bit of, of, uh, of flexibility to do it at the time of PCI 
or a stage within the index admission. And if you look at the appropriateness criteria, you can see here after successful treatment of the culprit artery for STEMI patients, right? Yep. You can have immediate revascularization during the same procedure. If you have a patient in cardiogenic shock and you think that there are multiple culp culprit uh, vessels, uh, if you have stable patient immediately with severe stenosis, it may be appropriate. Uh, and uh, presumed culprit artery with more intermediate lesions, it may be appropriate as well. So there's no inappropriate here in the same procedure. If you can do it the same hospitalization, same index admission, if you have signs of ischemia, you can do it. Uh, and symptomatic patient, but with signs of ischemia on non-invasive testing. So either symptoms or findings of ischemia on a test, uh, those are appropriate. Asymptomatic, no additional testing, severe stenosis. If you have a 90% LAD lesion, uh, but the patient is asymptomatic, you know that this lesion is probably going to be ischemia provoking. And if you have uh, somebody who's asymptomatic with intermediate stenosis, it's rarely appropriate. It's not appropriate to go in and uh, same admission after a STEMI to stent intermediate stenosis unless you do an FFR and they are ischemic by FFR evaluation. So uh, these are the guidelines or the appropriate use criteria for uh, complete revascularization in a patient who presents with a STEMI after successful revascularization of the culprit vessel. And as you can see here, it's either the same procedure or same hospitalization. A lot of actually uh, operators, uh, unless it's a, it's a very tight stenosis and a very simple lesion, will opt to stop and uh, do it at uh, a later date during the index hospitalization. Now, since these guidelines or appropriate criteria were, were published, the, there was the complete trial. Uh, it published in 2019. And again, it shows the, the same recurring theme that complete revascularization uh, carries a lower uh, incidence of an ischemic event of a death, cardiovascular cause, or new myocardial infarction, mostly driven by uh, uh, repeat myocardial infarction or need for emergent revascularization. Both are uh, actually lower uh, in patients who get complete revascularization during the index procedure. So the data is mounting that uh, if you have somebody with a STEMI and multivessel disease, uh, then you should actually uh, fix the culprit lesion and consider complete revascularization during, at least during the index hospitalization. So post-procedure, chest pain free, uh, EKG sort of uh, improved, not 100% normalized. Uh, so the question here is, uh, uh, how long do you keep this patient uh, on dual antiplatelet therapy for? STEMI patients. So I would go for, for, for at least 12 months, sure. Excellent. So, I think most people would go with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, although there, because there are certain risk, uh, features of, of risk of, of ischemic event in this patient, and we'll talk about a little bit uh, more. So, uh, that was the plan. Uh, this was at two o'clock in the morning. Patient was in the ICU, uh, stable, chest pain free. Four hours later at 6.30, she has this. She has chest pain. She has hypotension. And now the EKG shows this, 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 this all over the place. Wow. Mm. So, of course, she's taken emergently back to the cath lab. And as you can see here, there's acute stent thrombosis. Uh, so, uh, again, this is a, a little bit of, of a twist on uh, what are the potential causes for acute stent thrombosis, especially in the setting of a STEMI. Of course, it was uh, wired, uh, revascularized. You can see here uh, lots of thrombus burden here, here, uh, all over the place. Uh, thrombectomy was done and IVOS was performed. As you can see here, the stent is underexpanded. This is the, uh, the vessel uh, media there, and this is the stent uh, in there. This is proximal stent. And again, this can persists proximal uh, mid-segment uh, as well. So uh, after IVOS guided post dilation, actually they took a 3.5 millimeter non-compliant balloon to the proximal segment and uh, they got uh, flow back. And even with that uh, being achieved, uh, still the distal runoff is not very significant. There is here a, a residual stenosis that could not be uh, dilated. And there's a concern for possible edge dissection in that segment or within the stent. But uh, again, the patient did well at this point in time. Um, and uh, these are sort of some of the things that actually happened. So treatment was aspiration thrombectomy, aggressive post-dilation, 
aggressive anticoagulation, 2B3A inhibitors immediately, of course. And uh, what they did was actually, uh, again, to Dr. Abdelmajid's point, they switched uh, from ticagrelor to prasugrel based on the uh, ISO-REACT-5. Uh, and uh, that was uh, what the patient happened. So acute stent thrombosis in this patient, uh, clearly there was stent under expansion. And you could not tell uh, by the size of the vessel initially that this was a three millimeter vessel. Uh, there was a concern for edge dissection, although on the IVAS that they performed, uh, there was not very uh, evident. Uh, there was a concern initially about uh, whether the patient was loaded with antiplatelet therapy in the emergency department before she went to the cath lab, but going back and reviewing, she actually did get the ticagrelor before going to the cath lab. And of course, there's a concern for the poor distal runoff and a smallish uh, co-dominant RCA, and this could not be helped, but again, uh, would con uh, constitute some concern for uh, an ischemic event down the line or a uh, recurrent stent uh, thrombosis. Uh, the ISR REACT-5, as you all mentioned, uh, the price of grill uh, was uh, uh, superior to ticagrelor in preventing ischemic uh, events. So now, patient ha had a STEMI, had a stent, stent thrombosis, and now uh, is fixed. How long would you keep her on that? We had 12 months before. Would you consider uh, prolongation of uh, the, uh, the therapy. And while the audience uh, are, are polling, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Abmajid and, and Dr. Fabrizio to, uh, you know, to chime in. I, mean, uh, I think Fabrizio talk, so, uh, took the first part. I, would, uh, I mean, you know, you, you hear uh, the risk probably is uh, different. I know, uh, you know, she, she had a stent thrombosis. But you, you know, you IVAS there, you optimize, you find the endo expansion of the stent. So I'm not sure if the risk is still the same and if I would change, you know, the same recommendation of a minimum of 12 months. Definitely, I would, I would, in my report, I would say a minimum of 12 months. I would reassess after 12 months. And uh, also it would depend on uh, what is the plan for the, you know, for the, for the, for the left system. Uh, but uh, definitely, let, at least the 12 months, I would reassess the risk, uh, you know, bleeding risk, and uh, and if possible, I would I would take it longer, you know, if the bleeding risk is not high. Okay, Fabrizio. Yeah, i I agree. So she's a 65 years lady. She has no she diabetes, is. as I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, no diabetic. Uh, Small stand, she implanted 225 and long because it wears two stand with overlapped segment. Already had one stand thrombosis. I don't know if she has any CKD or not. And um, so, overall, after 12 months, if everything is fine, I think uh, he, she will even have her other, other vessel stented. So, uh, will be, uh, I think she finished with three vessel PCI. Uh, so, I think I would, I would continue if everything is fine after 12 months, I would continue for, for, for a longer period. Uh, the dual antiplatelet therapy. Okay, so this is the data for the uh, for the polling, and uh, you know, majority of people will go 12 months. Some people will go 24 months. Um, I don't think this is a patient who is a candidate for three months uh, or six months at this point in time. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Definitely. Still, so, I mean, the question, uh, Paula, is you know, would you, uh, you know, I know the patient went on the prosegro. But, uh, you know, would you, uh, you know, is there any preference? I, I know that I react still, I'm not strong, believe, you know, I don't see it. It's an open label trial. It's, I know it's a large trial, but, you know, the, 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 I mean, one thing is, you know, that the open label, bad thing is the availability of the drug uh, in a lot of places in the world. So if you are to select between clopidogrel and uh, say ticagrelor and such patients for how long understanding they, the cost uh, part. I would do the ticagrelor and I would do for at least 12 months. And I would actually, uh, again, calculate the DAP score. Um, she's 65. So uh, that's uh, a negative one. Uh, she has MI on presentation. She has 10 diameter less than three. Um, so she has, she's borderline on the DAP score for a prolonged, uh, Duration. Yeah. Uh, I would continue with the with Acaglor definitely for at least twelve months, and I would have a very low threshold for staying uh, keeping her on the Acaglor uh, longer. Okay, great. Excellent. So uh, we we went through this case, and, and there was a lot of stuff here. There was uh, 
you know, antiplatelet therapy initially with, with STEMI, complete revascularization uh, and STEMI versus, uh, you know, discharge and, and bring back, uh, stem thrombosis and factors of stem thrombosis, and after stem thrombosis duration antiplatelet therapy. Um, I think this was uh, a case that uh, hit on multiple points, and uh, uh, I thank my, uh, my colleagues for uh, the, their input and their uh, advice and, and their uh, educational comments, and uh, this was a uh, great case. The last one. Thank Good you case. very much. Uh, yeah, we got a few questions that I think we'll keep them to the end. We'll go to the second uh, case by uh, Fabrizio. Uh, so Dr. Fabrizio uh, on uh, Sheikh Khalifa Hospital, special hospital in Rasul Khaima, is going to present us another case, and we'll uh, you now we'll uh, we'll have a discussion. Go ahead, uh, Fabrizio. So thank you. You can stop sharing your. Uh, yeah, Correct. stop sharing. I'm trying. I can, to... I can go Hello? over with mine. Okay. Ah, there you Great. are. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So, first of all, very wonderful presentation. You make my minds very much easier. Uh, now, we are discussing here about what we have to do when we have one patient hitting our catalog and there is very high risk bleeding. So, I present here one case we did recently. A uh, very old lady, she is 90 years old, presented with type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Uh, she had CKD with uh, an EGFR below 30. Uh, HB level presentation was 9.5, and she has history of chronic non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs use because of rheumatoid arthritis. She presented as inferior STEMI, so similar condition of uh, the ones we saw before. And of course, when you, uh, when you start a procedure in a 90 years old lady, which one you don't know many things, for example, you don't know which is the EGFR level, uh, you don't know how much is the hemoglobin level, uh, not all the history is very clear. Uh, it's always, you know, it's always a, a, a question mark what to do and how extensive you have to treat and even um, regarding the full vascularization or not during the index procedure is always, you know, it's not very recommended, especially because 90 years old can have multiple reasons for not going for extensive stenting. So this is our primary PCI. You see there is the um, occlusion of the RCA in the, in the, in the mid-segment. Uh, and she received one uh, single death, small one, 225, 34, so a very long one. Uh, the distal flow, as in the previous case, is not very nice. Uh, we can see there is TME1 flow at the end of the procedure. So anyhow, patient, patient didn't have any stent thrombosis in this case, so we are in a different scenario here. But I'd like you to, to go through a little bit of the Academic Research Consortium uh, high-risk bleeding criteria, which were presented before by Dr. Tarek in a, few, in a very nice slides. So we here have uh, two major criteria for high-risk bleeding, according to the uh, Academic Research Consortium. Uh, she had severe CKD, uh, and there's a hemoglobin level which is below 11 gram per deciliter. Plus, there are two minor criteria, which is age over 75 years and long-term use of oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So as you know, the definition of high-risk bleeding uh, it's one major criteria uh, or two minor criteria. So she is even a little bit more than high risk bleeding. And we know that patient with high risk bleeding uh, as, a, as, as a risk of bark three or five, so severe bleeding, let's say of life threatening, life -threatening bleeding or uh, cerebral hemorrhage, which is more than 4% in one year. And risk of ICH, which is more of 1% in one year. So uh, uh, I don't have a poll here about what, what to do, but we can go through the poll if you want. So which would you do in this case? So would you, would you choose long or short treatment or with dual antiplatelet therapy? Uh, would you stay on uh, which, which, is, which of the P2? P2 you got, you got well, a you case, uh, Fabrizio. Sorry? A nice you, you got us a tough case, a 90 years old with for yeah. uh, death, you know, <laughs> and Chicago. So, I, I don't so know, I would give it to a and see what, what part of things, and then so, I guess. Which oh, is yeah, the, 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 the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Excellent. 
short or long dual <laughs> antibiotic therapy, which one, which one would you choose uh, on top of aspirin? Would you drop aspirin or would you drop your, your P2, P2 uh, epsilon 12 at the end of the dual antibiotic therapy duration? So yeah. which, is, which is your, your feeling let, here? Let, let us get our uh, audience and let's select the short or the long DAP. So short means something around three months or three to six months or 12 months. So yeah. short is A, long is B. Uh, Ziad uh, from the control, can you uh, help us on that? So if possible, you know, maybe that slide is not prepared, but if possible, if not, we'll just go to the discussion. So uh, uh, let's get, let's get uh, Dr. Tarp. What do you um, you know? If, if let's go to short or long, how would, would you go with the you know a three month or twelve months? Ninety year so, old lady was breastfeeding. So th there are a couple of, of, of things that um, that you, I would like to know first. Does she have uh, other coronary artery disease, or is this the only lesion in her RCA? No, no, there was only this lesion, no other uh, coronary artery. No other coronary artery disease. There was um, an intermediate, intermediate left, left main lesion, but FFR negative. So, okay. So, uh, I would go with the dual antiplater therapy probably for uh, six months if she doesn't have any bleeding issues. And then I would stop the aspirin, continue on the ticagrelor uh, beyond that, at least for 12 months. And then she can go back to 81 milligrams of aspirin indefinitely. Okay, so this, so you 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 would choose ticagrelor, let's say over even over over plavix, even uh, even knowing that she is very high risk of bleeding. Anyhow, or, or, even or, for the first three or six months of dual antibiotic therapy. Correct. Okay. Okay. Majid, which would you be your uh, choice? So, uh, you know, uh, regarding the choice of the, you know, of the P2Y12 inhibitor, uh, definitely, of course, not prasugrel. I mean, we don't have it, but I, if we have it available, I would not use it, uh, you know, for the obvious reasons. But uh, they, uh, I would go with the aspirin plus uh, either clopidogrel or uh, ticagrelor, and for at least the three months, you know, and of course, I mean, yes, yes, have frequently, uh, you know, to ensure that she, she doesn't have any, uh, any bleeding. Uh, understanding that the risk of, uh, you know, of atherosclerosis, as you say, the left system is, is okay. Of course, her age puts her at a high risk and, uh, you know, for, for the current event, but her bleeding risk, I think, is outweigh that in the decision making. So short, I would go the three month and uh, and then re, uh, and reassess. After, after three months, would you would you drop the aspirin or would you drop the p the tacagular in this case in your case? Uh, after three months, to be honest with you, I would switch. I would drop the aspirin, but uh, if possible, and I don't know what the Tatar thinks is, I would switch to a clopidogrel. And uh, you know, looking at the old data from aspirin. Uh, clopidogrel, like the Capri data, you know, uh, clopidogrel is relatively safer, you know, compared to, to aspirin, aspirin alone. Uh, I don't know if you of what would you, you know, if you are to, you know, so uh, yes, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, the, if you look at the, the data from the Plato trial, and it was in addition to aspirin, but there was no increased risk of bleeding for ticagrelor versus uh, clopidogrel on top of aspirin. I don't think hmm. we have a lot of data for ticagrelor alone as a single agent. Uh, uh, we know from the Capri that uh, aspirin versus Plavix, Plavix was uh, you know, significantly better in reducing ischemic events. Uh, but uh, given the fact that uh, she does have a small RCA, she does have poor flow in the distal RCA, and knowing that uh, you know, she's 90 years old and, and, and that a new insult would not be very well tolerated, uh, I would be more inclined to continue for at least six months uh, with ticagrelor and uh, then consider switching to either Plavix or continue ticagrelor for 12 months and then 81 milligrams of aspirin. Now, during this time, if she ever gets into a situation where there's increased risk of bleeding or she has anemia, then I would fall back on the, uh, uh, the flexibility of three months of dual antiplatelet therapy and then switch down to 81 milligrams of aspirin uh, by itself because of a bleeding issue. 
Okay. I mean, yeah. apart from this case, I know this is the, the you know, uh, a, um, uh, you know, uh, if you are, you know, if, you, if, if we took the previous case, say, for example, and you are to drop, would you drop aspirin or would you drop a P2I12 inhibitor? At which point? I mean, you presented that we so, like. Eh? Yeah, so but no, uh, our, our decision was mainly driven by the twilight trial. So actually, yeah, high risk of bleeding, so which is for the shortened time, which is three months, which actually the same period they, they use in twilight trials. And after okay. three months of dual anticlinated, we just stopped the aspirin. So we dropped we drop our aspirin and keep her on tagagler. And she, she is now in, uh, yet in the three months phase. So the last, the last checkup was fine. Hemoglobin was not uh, reduced and she was, she was doing fine. So I don't know if this strategy will pay off at the very end of the 12 months or not, but this is our, I mean, our, our, our strategy at the beginning. Um, yes. I don't I know. That's very reasonable. Honestly, I think this is yeah, very reasonable. Right. The only thing I would, I would consider doing different if, if she has no bleeding issues, I would try to continue, continue the dual antiplatelet therapy for maybe six months and then drop the aspirin like you're, like you're planning to do. Uh, but I think this is very reasonable. Yeah, it's, it, it's an option. Let's see. I mean, let's see what happened and then we decide. And I, I have another question for Dr. Terry, if I may. Uh, so this is 90 years and she has several risk of, of uh, high risk bleeding. Uh, but if you have very, very an elderly patient, or so let's say uh, over 80, 85 years old, so which are the type of patient usually are excluded from the clinical trials, what, what do you usually do in this kind of patient after stenting in ACS, during, after ICS, uh, which is your, your strategy? How do you manage with the very, el the very elderly, even if there is not all, all of these risk factors for bleeding? So you're absolutely right. They are, these patients are underrepresented in the, uh, in the acute coronary syndrome uh, trials, but uh, these patients are actually very well represented in the, in the TAVR trials. And the TAVR patients uh, usually did get uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for at least six to 12 months. Uh, so uh, I'm, it's, a, it's an individual decision. I've seen 85 year old patients that uh, are fairly healthy with, with not multiple risk factors and uh, at low risk for bleeding. And with those, I continue the guideline directed therapy for six to 12 months with that. And, and this patient, like you, you presented, she has multiple risk factors for bleeding. So uh, I would shoot for uh, three to six months if possible. And if there's any sign of early bleeding, I, um, I would stop the dual antiplatelet therapy and continue with a single antiplatelet agent. Okay. Uh, 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 thanks Fabrizio. I mean, this is a, you know, this is a great case. And uh, you know the, the duration of uh, of the DAPT is uh, is a usual challenge. I mean, and again, it's you know it, it is the patient that you have to look at their risk uh, of uh, you know of, uh, of atherothrombosis and uh, an event you know a um, atherothrombotic event as compared to bleeding uh, uh, risk, and uh, and then decide you know how long and which which drugs you want to take. Now, the question again to, uh, to both of you, um, Tarek and Fabrizio, you know, if you are to drop uh, the, you know, you're switching from DAPT to a single uh, monotherapy, you know, I know we, you know, our routine still, we, do, we, you know, we go down to aspirin. But do you see a role to, or do you see a time to switch from this practice to, you know, to, um, to going down to a monotherapy of a P2I12 inhibitor. If uh, Dr. I, yeah, the, Dr. there's not a, a specific recommendation with ACS patients. Uh, if you look at the new guidelines for uh, combination of anticoagula anticoagulation therapy as well as antiplatelets, uh, they drop the aspirin uh, routinely and they continue the P2I12 uh, with, the, with the DOAC. Um, so I think there's, there's a signal there where we can actually consider doing the, uh, the P2Y12. Uh, it is a more potent, uh, but it, in certain cases, it will carry a risk of bleeding. Um, uh, in, in a patient like this, I would go for single uh, agent uh, P2Y12 uh, like Fabrizio did. The other point to make, and the, and the guidelines do recommend this, is to put these patients on uh, PPIs. And uh, you know, uh, aggressively and, and sort of uh, proactively, rather than wait for a, a an occult or a, a frank GI bleed and have to catch up later. Um, so this is another point that uh, that we should mention to 
to the audience is that the use of PPI is, is recommended in patients who potentially will, uh, will have uh, some bleeding risk. Uh, and a large proportion of these patients actually will either have a GI bleed or an enterprise. So is there a guiding, a, guiding, a guiding algorithm or, or a decision uh, you know, uh, that, that helps you to decide when to put the patient on a routine PPI um, or not? Uh, so, which I mean, let's put the question another way, uh, another uh, wording. Which patient would you say goes on a PPI, you know, while they're on that? Uh, so, I think any patients with with, with high risk of bleeding uh, should be considered. And honestly, um, if I'm going to continue dual antibiotic therapy and I'm worried about uh, ischemic events, I I would. Uh, if no contraindications are there, I would consider doing PPIs for, uh, for the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy to avoid any potential bleeding issues. Um, I'll let Fabrizio uh, yeah, tell I, us I, his I, experience I, as well. I agree, Dr. Tarek. For, I think uh, every patient, especially patient over 60, 65 years old, uh, which, is, uh, which are in anyhow some, some risk of developing any GI bleeding, I, I would recommend for all of them uh, to, start a PPI, to start a PPI especially during the dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, right. And maybe if you think that's with right. Hesperin, I, I would continue PPI uh, for all the time, even after the dual antiplatelet therapy, if they are old, older than 65 years old. Uh, regarding right. uh, regarding your, your previous question, so um, was uh, related to shifting or... Yeah, uh, so shifting or with monotherapy on, on P2Y, P2Y 12 inhibitors or uh, on hesperin, um, I, I, I don't think there is enough data to give us a clear, a clear path, which one we should stop after 12 months, uh, hesperin or any P2, P2Y inhibitors. Um, sure, I will not continue indefinitely with the very more potent P2Y inhibitors. If I want to stop hesperin and continue on that one, I would shift on Plavix. If I have to, I have to, if I have to decide, but I don't think there is enough data about this. Uh, so it's 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 more a decision patient by patient, and after twelve months, usually right. in the very elderly, which are maybe a little bit higher risk of, of bleeding of GI bleeding, I would I, usually I I stop aspirin and continue on clopidogrel now, and um, that's what I do usually. Thank you for the zero. So I, you know, I, we got another twenty minutes. I, I hope uh, I can finish this case in you know in less than ten minutes, and then we can go to the question answers. Uh, so uh, my case is quick one. Uh, so this is a forty-six male uh, ex-smoker hypertensive and diabetic. He had a uh, sudden onset of severe chest pain, and uh, he uh, his wife activated the EMS uh, system when they arrived. Uh, he was uh, found to be in a VF uh, arrest, and uh, he was shocked and got to the hospital where, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, of course, Ross was achieved, and uh, he was found to be, to have the, uh, these ECG uh, changes, which is uh, clearly inferior posterior ST elevation, uh, myocardial infarction, taken to the cath lab. And uh, we found uh, this anatomy. Uh, so uh, he, this is his left system, as you can see. I mean, he got a ectatic uh, vessel, uh, mainly the proximal LED, but uh, there's no uh, obstructive uh, uh, disease in the, in the left coronary system. On the uh, right coronary system, as you would expect from the presentation, he got a heavy thrombus involving the distal uh, right coronary artery with the slow flow, and of course, ectatic uh, uh, RCA. So uh, uh, we went ahead and, uh, of course, wired this vessel in, uh, and did uh, a thrombectomy uh, on this case. And I would leave this, uh, you know, for a, just a, a, you know, a quick uh, opinion. Uh, so uh, uh, Fabrizio and Dr. Farah, who you guys still use thrombectomy in a selective cases. I know the guidelines gave it, you know, a class three for routine use. Do you still use thrombectomy? Uh, personally, personally, uh, I don't use thrombectomy so much. Uh, I'm okay. not very fond, fond of thrombectomy, uh, unless there is... Uh, 
huge thrombus burden, but it should be very huge. I, I, I usually don't use it. Yeah, it's a part of you still use so it. So we, right? we still use thrombectomy in selective cases. I, I agree. There's there's always a, an indication um, for patients like this with a, a large focal thrombus burden. Um, okay. the, the risk of, of uh, ballooning this without, uh, you know, uh, uh, using a thrombectomy prior is that uh, you break down the clot and you shower distally and you end up with a no reflow. Uh, and in that situation, this is a, a, a condition that it's very difficult to reverse and very difficult to treat. Uh, if you have a focal thrombus, you can try to aspirate. Uh, we've done intracoronary 2B3A, we've done intracoronary uh, lytics, um, you know, uh, and if all fails, you can always, you know, stent the, the thrombus to the wall. Uh, but if you just balloon it and, and uh, you shower downstream, uh, you end up with microvascular obstruction, then uh, we see, we've seen in, in certain cases, uh, lack of resolution of SE segments, uh, poor timid uh, flow and, and myocardial blush distally. Um, and, uh, you know, these patients don't do well long term. Yeah. I mean, despite the aggressive, I mean, this patient presented with a BF uh, arrest. Now, we did a multiple runs of uh, thrombectomy, and this is what we got. So we decided at this stage to stop and keep them on, on anticoagulation and antiplatelet for a few days. Uh, I, I don't know what's, Yanni, what's your, uh, Yanni, what, would, what would be your practice in that? I, mean, I know there's no, you know, no uh, hard science in it, but uh, would, uh, would you all agree with such a practice or would you put a stent or, or call the patient for some time. And in this case, we decided not to stand. Yeah, I, we've, we've done the same thing with, with certain patients who presented with this, with this uh, situation. Uh, we've, we've, we've had a, a multiple patients with uh, coronary aneurysms actually that, that had thrombosis um, without a definite plaque. Uh, and we ended up uh, doing aspiration and doing uh, undersized ballooning to restore flow and kept them on uh, uh, anticoagulation, antiplatelet therapy for a few days uh, with improvement on repeat angio. Um, routine use of, of that approach is, is not strongly uh, encouraged. The, the ISAR cool trial uh, yeah. showed that there was no benefit to cooling the patients with um, antithrombotics and antiplatelets and coming back later. Uh, if you can deal with the, with the issue uh, acutely, you, you're encouraged. But again, in this case, the thrombus is large, uh, the, the vessel is ectatic. Uh, and as you can see from this and, and other vessels, there's not a lot of uh, coronary stenosis and underlying plaque. Um, uh, so I, I think it's probably very reasonable what you did is that you stabilized the patient, restored flow, aborted the MI, and then you want to optimize uh, your situation for a more definitive therapy uh, in a few days. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I agree. The routine thrombectomy is not is not recommended and routine defer or routine you know, routine stent deferring is not something that's recommended unfortunately in this case we have to do both uh, to do thrombectomy and to do and to go kind of against the guidelines uh, so we you know this is ecg post and it was uh, you know normalized uh, post cat and we brought him a few days later i think two days uh, after the um, the initial uh, angioplasty uh, after you know, after his uh, initial presentation, and still he got some uh, thrombus um, uh, present, but the flow is definitely better. And uh, my colleague who did him at that time uh, decided to balloon that uh, PDA and kind of help improving the flow to it to the to the PDA, but decided not to to touch the thrombus or or stent it. And as you can see here, uh, this is the uh, this is the results here. So still there's a you know, there's a good size thrombus there. The flow, you know, as you said, uh, part, you know, when you touch it, you know, you just, you know, just start getting distal embolization. And I think that's what they, uh, you know, they got uh, pulled by that stenosis in the PDA and decided to, you know, to, to balloon it. Uh, so, um, the, so the patient was kept again on longer period of, of uh, intravenous anticoagulation and antiplatelet. And, and this is the final result. Uh, so I'm going to ask you about the longer term dual antiplatelet in this high risk patient. But before that, you know, I received a question in the Q and A's, uh, 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 and and one of the uh, attendees was asking, you know, the role of IV intravenous antiplatelets. 
And I, I don't know what's your thoughts. Uh, Fabrizio, do you use uh, intravenous uh, antiplatelets? I mean, in this case, we use aptifibatide, but uh, this was, you know, uh, some time back. So I uh, use no, sure. you know, use it. Uh, in, in this case, in case like this, where there is huge thrombus burden, uh, uh, usually, yes, we, we use dual, uh, so, sorry, 2B3A inhibitors, uh, especially if, the, if uh, the result of you have any, any, any distal embolization and the flow is not perfect, there is a lot of thrombus. We know usually that this kind of thrombus is red thrombus more than white, but there's still some platelet uh, aggregation there. So it, I think it's still useful. And I think your strategy just to wait and avoid any stenting here was very really successful, even, even because yeah, this artery is, is seven millimeters, something like, so you would finish with a stent, uh, with a stent uh, uh, malaposition under percent. It will not be able to, uh, to oppose the stent to the, to the coronary artery wall perfectly. So I don't think the result with a stent would have been very nice. And as we see here, there is no stenosis. There is actually no stenosis. Yeah. So maybe it was no plaque erosion, some, some plaque erosion that, that uh, sparked the, the, coagulation, the, the coagulation inside the artery uh, more, than, uh, more than plaque rupture or something different. Yeah. Uh, do you still use IV uh, GP2 inhibitors or IV antiplatelet therapy? Yes, we do. Mo most of the time we use them as, as bailout strategies in case of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, vessel thrombosis or resistant thrombus as, as, as seen here. Uh, the earlier ISR REACT trials actually showed that uh, in patients with uh, positive toponins, acute coronary syndrome and STEMIs, um, there is benefit, there's added benefit and there's added platelet inhibition with the use of 2B3A in, intravenously on top of uh, oral dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, so that benefit has been, has been seen and, and proven and uh, although uh, there has been uh, some potential uh, increase in bleeding in these patients who get uh, 2B3As, um, and you see that mostly in femoral access patients, and I saw you guys did this uh, radially, um, and uh, especially if you're going to use uh, some large bore uh, circulatory devices, you get a lot of oozing and you get a lot of bleeding. But, uh, you know, in radial cases, uh, that, that's uh, less that of, a, of a risk. And uh, uh, as you can see here, the benefit is clear. And... Uh, you know, we've been surprised before, and again, same here, the, 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 the clot and the thrombus re resolves, and uh, the artery looks, um, you know, quite healthy afterwards, um, and, uh, you know, I think what you did in this case was, uh, was probably the right choice. Great, thanks. Uh, so, uh, so the question, um, I mean, to, to, the, uh, uh, to, the, to, to the attendees and to you guys is, you know, what, so what antiplatelet regimen would you select? Uh, would you go for adapt for one year and then downgrade to aspirin, or the same question, or adapt for one year and then downgrade to P2Y12 inhibitor or a lifelong adapt, or adapt and then no arc? I know some people still would like to use, you know, um, yeah, uh, I mean, some people used warfarin and uh, and ectatic vessel, and when we got the no arcs, they uh, they switched using no arcs in such patients. Um, I know it's not a so straightforward uh, decision, uh, but um, you know I, I don't know if there's a poll for this. You can put it while waiting for that. We want to see uh, what you uh, what our panelists think. So I think, given the the thrombus burden uh, and the presentation of uh, STEMI and defibrillast, I would be more inclined. Uh, for a more aggressive antiplatelet strategy, I would consider this a, a high ischemic uh, risk patient rather than a high bleeding risk patient. He's 46 yeah. years old uh, and not a lot of comorbidities. So I would be more inclined for a more aggressive antiplatelet regimen. Uh, I would do at least 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, uh, and then evaluate. Uh, there's always the question of anticoagulation in uh, aneurysmal uh, arteries um, and uh, whether this was a more of a, a turbulent flow uh, situation with the stagnation and, and formation of thrombus versus uh, plaque erosion like Fabrizio was mentioning. Uh, these are always um, questions that you have to think about and, and uh, consider when you're trying to decide your management strategy. But I think 
uh, again, uh, there's not a lot of data on this. Uh, there, there is a couple. Uh, there are a couple of papers actually uh, looking at the recommendations of anticoagulation in patients with coronary aneurysms, and uh, uh, I don't remember uh, right off my head what uh, what the number is for the, for the diameter. But uh, apparently, there has been some uh, recommendations based on that. Uh, but I, I agree with you completely. I think P2Y12 dual antiplatelet therapy for at least a year. Great. Yeah, Fabrizio. Yeah. I, I completely agree with, we don't have so many, so much data about using or not uh, NOAC, especially NOAC either, uh, in uh, very large uh, aneurysmatic coronary arteries. Uh, I, I completely agree. I will keep this patient, which is even young patient, where the presentation has been triple fibrillation on dual antiplatelet therapy for maybe even one, more than one year. Uh, if we do the, the DAP score, I think the DAP score will say that he has very low risk of bleeding and uh, there is some catch up with, uh, with uh, continuing the dual antiplatelet therapy for more than 12 months if everything is fine after 12 months. Uh, usually we don't we don't use uh, anticoagulation in uh, in a, even in uh, aneurysmatic uh, coronary arteries. We just keep patient on uh, on dual antiplatelet therapy, even because we know that giving with protriple therapy is not an option. Uh, there is too much too much uh, high increase in in bleeding, and uh, I don't know. I don't feel like removing one antiplatelet in this case will be beneficial, or at least we don't have enough enough data to say, okay, let's go over only one one antiplatelet and 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 an oral oral yeah. anticoagulation. I think I mean uh, as you stated, I mean his his risk of thrombosis and uh, and also the you know the presenting with the VFRS is pushing him at the high risk is of, of you know of um, of a cardiovascular events uh, compared to the risk of bleeding. Again, I mean this case is as uh, you all uh, so the uh, you know the decision is not so straightforward when it comes to you know deciding the the choice or the length of the treatment duration of treatment uh, there is a lot of factors that you have to consider and you have to assess uh, before uh, making those choices and uh, the, the, we have a lot of data and also the guidelines there's some controversies in this uh, area of uh, antiplatelet management that we have to to understand and i think you know um, if you are in a dilemma i think it's very important to discuss such cases uh, before making a uh, you know a hard decision especially when you you're dealing with the high risk uh, high risk patients uh, we got another few minutes uh, we we go over a few questions uh, from the uh, from our attendees uh, so Majid, do... I, I just want to make a quick point, please, before we move on to this point. Okay. Uh, the, the, on your slide, you mentioned the option of uh, anticoagulation. Uh, I would like to remind myself and, and the audience as well with the, of the results of the ATLAS ACS2 TIMI-51 trial, uh, okay. which, which was a use of rivaroxaban uh, on top of uh, aspirin as compared to dual antiplatelet therapy and showed a significant reduction in ischemic events. Uh, there was a price to pay with increased bleeding, uh, but if you consider that this patient is a younger patient with a low risk of bleeding and a significant uh, risk of uh, thrombosis, I think uh, you know uh, you you probably want to consider the uh, the results of the Atlas uh, rivaroxaban trial in ACS patients in this in, uh, in this case. Yeah. So you so yeah. So Atlas would yeah, and you you know you may. Uh, apply it to such a scenario. Uh, I know they. I mean that. I mean this patient is kind of is, is, is special. Uh, you know, with the, with the with the very high thrombocytic vessel. But you're right. I mean that's a uh, that's at least a, you know a data that you may uh, you may uh, use to support your uh, decision making like that. Uh, the uh, I mean one of the questions we, uh, I got is is around the preloading. I know we'll go back to that, but. Uh, are you still preloading your patients, uh, Farah? Yes, we are. And Fabrizio? Yes, we are preloading. Yeah, so, uh, so there's a question, you know, when they, when they saw the results of the, of the two trials that you presented, uh, we had a question. So the guidelines and, and the, the European guidelines uh, are, have just been revised. It's published in 2020. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of considerations are, are taken into account there. Number one, the increased risk of bleeding um, in patients who end up not having ACS. And number two is uh, the unknown anatomy. And uh, we've had several patients who ended up needing uh, uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. Uh, and they had to wait in the hospital for five days because they were preloaded with ticagalor or 600 of Plavix. Uh, and uh, that also, all, all of that brings into question uh, the value of preloading. But uh, I will be honest with you, uh, our protocols uh, are, have not been revised and we continue to preload our ACS patients. Uh, another question, let's get a quick uh, answer to it. The, the large thrombus, the case that I presented one, um, one question raised the, uh, you know, the point of using the, the direct thrombolysis in such patients. Do you use? Did you do you ever use the direct thrombolysis on on intracoronary? I haven't used it for you know very long time. I don't know if any of you. No, never the used direct thrombolytics. Intracoronary, no. Yeah, for such a case like the case I presented, the heavy thrombus, would you? Yes, we've, we've used that several, I mean, several times. We, we've faced these cases uh, quite often, actually, in, in St. Louis. We've had a run of, of patients who present with large thrombus burden and, and uh, aneurysmal coronaries. Uh, and uh, uh, two milligrams of uh, uh, intracoronary uh, uh, lytics uh, actually right. worked very well uh, in combination with uh, intravenous 2B3A. And, and sometimes what we do is for the 2B3A uh, uh, loading dose, I take half of that dose and I, I push it intracoronary very slowly uh, to avoid any conduction abnormalities and change in the met metabolism of the, of the heart. And uh, we give the, uh, the other half of the loading dose intravenous and we continue them on 2B3A for uh, 12 to 24 hours. So we have used intracoronary uh, thrombolytics, we have used intracoronary uh, 2B3A inhibitors and uh, in large thrombus burden cases, uh, they work very well. And if you end up with a case of uh, limited uh, flow or no reflow distally, uh, the use of uh, intracoronary adenosine also is, is considered yes. because you worry about the, the showering and distal embolization like Dr. Abdel Majid mentioned in his case. And uh, the use of adenosine here works very well in restoring the microvascular uh, flow. Yeah, we don't store a lytic in the cath lab, but I think it's a good idea to, to do so in such and maybe in some of this uh, scenarios. They, we usually uh, call, call for it from pharmacy. It's, it's rare that we use it, so we don't carry it in the, in the Pixis in the cath lab, but uh, pharmacy okay. knows that uh, when we call for two milligrams of, of lytics, they, they're ready to, to uh, send it up to the cath lab right away. Yeah, is there any data published on this? I know it's a small, usually, uh, a group so of patients. There's no, I don't think there's data for intracoronary thrombolytics. There is um, a one German trial early on for intracoronary 2B3A. And this was early in the days of uh, apsiximab and, uh, and most of the, actually, most of the data for intracoronary 2B3A with, is with apsiximab, uh, which not a lot of people use still. Uh, but you're right. Uh, th this is not a, a, a common enough occurrence where you can actually run a trial uh, and figure out if this is something that uh, should make it into the guidelines. Excellent. Great. Uh, last question. I know we're over time. But, uh, one of the uh, audience asked about if a patient is on NAWAT, okay, and he presents with an anastomy, would you load him or not? Ah, so excellent, what question. Ask excellent question. Uh, so the guidelines that we presented for anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy do not address the upfront loading of these agents. They only address the strategy after a stent is placed. So given the... Uh, the lack of recommendation for triple therapy uh, and given the uh, emerging data for the European guidelines to avoid preloading, I think there's a very reasonable argument that if somebody's already on a NOAC and you give them aspirin, you take them to the cath lab, that's probably reasonable. The other option is you worry about the, somebody with acute coronary syndrome or STEMI and you uh, put them on dual antiplatelet therapy and then you continue on the uh, oral anticoagulation and you know, for a few days, you can keep them on triple therapy because of your, your concern of ischemic risk, and then you stop it. 
that's also a, val a valid option uh, that you can uh, evaluate. I think that's a fair opinion. Uh, any points, uh, Fabrizio, before we come to the closure? Any points, uh, Tara? No, I think, uh, uh, thank you. This was an, an excellent uh, refresher for me, actually, to, to go back and, and read all about this stuff and, and uh, listen to the, uh, to the uh, advice and, and, and input from, from you and Fabrizio and address the questions. And uh, I think it was an excellent program. And I thank you for putting this together. And thank you for inviting me. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. And thanks, uh, Fabrizio. Sorry, sorry, I, I, was, I just went offline. I don't know why. Um, kind of, I don't know what, what was your discussion in the last few minutes. <laughs> But anyhow, I see that time no, is we just, you know, We're just coming to the closing. So we appreciate your contribution. And uh, uh, Dr. Tarek Helmi, uh, the Chief of Cardiology and Professor of Medicine uh, from US and Dr. Fabrizio from uh, uh, UAE. Uh, this is uh, great. We've got a good uh, number of uh, attendees and participants in this program. I hope this was uh, useful to them. Uh, they, um, I would like to thank our colleagues from ICOM for, you know, for helping organizing this and uh, my colleagues in the STEMI uh, task force who, uh, who put the program and who uh, took care of the logistics. Uh, thank you again for the CME. Please uh, communicate with the event organizer and they will uh, provide uh, you, the, uh, you know, the certificates and I uh, will see you soon in a future activity. Thank you again to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.